Our lesson tonight comes from the 22nd Psalm. And I want to show how our God reigns over his people. You think about that idea, how our God reigns. It shows his authority and his position over those who are faithful to him. God cares for all mankind, just as Psalm 22 will point out that God cares for us. We talked a little bit about that this morning, showing how God loves us and how he cares for us as well. We'll begin, we'll just be going through these six verses Beginning in Psalm 22 and verse uh, 25, looking at the proclamation and vows that are made by the psalmist and his approach, you might say, to God. In Psalm 22 and verse 25, he says, and I've broken this verse in half, he says, My praise shall be of you and the great assembly. We understand the great assembly to be that with the saints. Today we'd say my praise is, will be of you when we come together to, with services, to worship services sometimes. The writer proclaims that his praise will be of God and not of man or some false god. You think about their time period in which they lived. There were idols literally all over, their pla all over the place. There were altars set up to all kinds of of false gods. In fact, we mentioned uh, this morning in our uh, Bible class, in our young Bible class, talking about how uh, during Isaiah's time, he mentions in Isaiah 1, uh, the kings that would, that would reign during his time, and only one tore down the altars of false gods and such, and a man by the name of Hezekiah. And so those, I, those things being present, throughout their entire time. And today, we still have the same ideas going around. We may not see altars of sacrifice, but we know full well we see various groups and their ideas contrary to the Word of God, whether, whether they be a denomination or something totally different. Think about Psalm 103 in verse 2, when he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits. We think about certain benefits we have in life. As a Christian, we know that we have various benefits because we are followers of Christ. For instance, Paul re references this. He talks about those, talks to those in, in Ephesus, Ephesus, and he talks about all the spiritual blessings that are in Christ. And it's important for us to remember that these types of bless, type of blessings are only for those who are followers of God as we see in the Old Testament, or those who are in Christ, that is in the New Testament time period in which we live today. So as we see here, he is proclaiming that he's going to praise God and Him alone in Psalm 20, 22, verse 25. But also notice the second part of verse 25. He says, I will pay my vows before those who fear Him. Now, vows is a reference there to the idea of a promise that is made. Now think about this for a moment. In a marriage ceremony, a promise is made, the vows are made, and basically, I'm going to summarize, the idea that you're going to be faithful to one another until one of you, you know, dies. You know, faithful to, to death. That's why we hear the phrase, to death do, do us part. We're going to be faithful to one another until death. When you think about this idea with the Christian, we are to be faithful to God, really, through death, aren't we? Even if death comes upon us because of our faithfulness to God, we are still to be faithful to Him. Revelation 2 and verse 10, which we quote many times about being faithful to God, the Bible says there, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. That does not mean be faithful until your life is threatened. Then it's okay to lose your faith. The idea there is be faithful even if it costs you your very life. You are to be faithful to God. There is a book entitled The Book of Martyrs. And in that book, it talks about all the different ways in which Christians died for their faith. And I actually have it in my office. And he goes through the various apostles and how they were killed, things they did to them. Peter being rumored as being crucified upside down. Others were literally tarred and feathered. Some were drugged for miles until their entrails came out. That did their being, they died to, main, to, main, to be 
to remain faithful to God. So I'm trying to get out. They remain faithful to God despite these things awaiting them. Because I'm sure when Peter was put on, as, it's, as history records, it's kind of a, a, a rumor that perhaps he was crucified like Christ, but instead he was crucified upside down. But there are those who were tied to horses knowing that they're going to be drugged to their, to their dead. There are those who were lit on fire like those who were put on uh, posts and lit on fire to light the pathway of men like Nero. They knew it was going to happen, but they remained faithful to God regardless of what took place. You remember three men by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were going to face a fiery furnace. And their reply together was, we don't have to answer you in this matter, O king, but even if our God does not save us, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, we will not bow down to your golden image. They knew it was going to, what was awaiting them. They knew there was a good chance when they were casting that fiery furnace, that was going to be it. But they still remained faithful to God. And that's the same idea we find here in Psalm 22 in verse uh, 25. And he says, I will pay my vows before those who fear Him. We must keep our vows to God also, and faithfulness is one of our vows. Look at Psalm uh, 61 and verse 8, where the Bible says, So I will sing praise to your name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. Is that not a reference there to daily faithfulness to God? If our vow is a promise to God, well, what's the promise that a Christian makes to God? That we're going to be with you to the end. You think about that idea, if we ever stop being faithful to God before He comes back, before Christ comes back, or before our life is over, if we ever stop before that, we have not performed our vow. Apparently that's as far as the PowerPoint is going to go tonight. But we see we are to be, perform our vow before God always. And so he says that I may perform, that I may daily perform my vows. Psalm 61 and verse 8. Now, next if you'll notice, we see, we see in Psalm 22 verse 25, now he, he, a proclamation concerning how he's going to give his praise to God and he will honor his vows. Now, well, it is working. So we see next in Psalm 22 and verse 26, the Lord, we're going to look at now reasons why He's going to keep His vow to God. One of the reasons why He's going to, and one of the reasons why He's going to worship God and worship God alone. You look at Psalm 22 and verse 26, we see that struggling will be cared for. Now there's a lot of interesting verses throughout the Old Testament especially that, that were some laws that were made by God, put in place by God, that was specifically designed to care for those who were in need. Look at Psalm 22 and verse 26. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek Him will praise the Lord. Let your hearts live forever. And so we see here, the poor shall eat and be satisfied. That's a reference to God taking care of those who are in need. Now, as I mentioned before, God made laws concerning the poor. Consider this in Leviticus 19 and verse 10. It says, And you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Glean a vineyard means when you went through and pulled all the grapes and everything off, you weren't to go through, basically not to go through a second time. Whatever's left, you leave it. For those, he says here, you see, you shall leave them for the poor and for the, and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. That phrase, I am the Lord your God, is telling us that's a commandment from God. You leave these for those who are in need. Now, was God looking out for the poor? He didn't have to make that law. He could have easily said, anyone who comes after you and takes that, a stranger or a poor person, that they are guilty of theft. But he didn't say that, did he? He says, leave that for those, for the, for the poor and for the stranger. Also notice Leviticus 20, or excuse me, Deuteronomy 24 
and verse 21. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. Again, you don't go through and try to get every single grape. If you miss one, you leave it. Now, you know of a vineyard, of course, there'll be a lot of, of grapes and those types of things on the vine. And so, obviously, you're probably going to miss one here and there. But the idea was you're to leave that. Because God wants to at least have that for those who were poor, those who are struggling. Concerning uh, cleaning fields, like the wheat fields and things like that, you were actually commanded to leave the corners for those who were poor and those who were strangers. And so God has always made provisions for those who are struggling. God even at times used prophets to show His care. Look at 1 Kings 17 and verse 12 through 14. The Bible says, So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks, and I may go in and prepare for myself and my son, who may eat it and die. Now this is in the midst of a drought. There is no water. And this prophet of God comes, and he's needing food, and he, we see here that this woman and her son, they have nothing. She says, we're going to prepare, basically we're going to prepare, we're going to prepare our last meal, and then we're just going to die. Because there was no water, there was nothing else which they had. But notice verse 13. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But make me a small cake from it first, and bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. Now, if you're the woman, and you hear, Go and do what you're going to do, but make me a small cake first. You're going to think, he's going to get, going to get all, that, all there is. But notice verse 14. The Bible says, For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall a jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. He's saying your flour bin is not going to go empty. The oil in that jar is not going to go empty. How nice would it be to go into the fridge and pour, the, pour out milk from your gallon jug and put it back and open up again and it's filled back to the top? Well, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Because we know how much we use milk and everything. Well, for them, it's the oil, it's the flour. It doesn't go empty. He says in verse 14, Until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. Those who cared for by God also will see, will go until others of His care. Look at Psalm 22, uh, verse 29 through 31. The Bible says, All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow down before Him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. That's a reference to the person who cannot even provide for themselves. Those, today, we probably, we would say we probably have those individuals who might be in nursing homes and things like that. They can't take care of themselves well. He's saying the Lord will take care of them, even the person who cannot keep himself alive. That should tell our friends who like to talk about euthanasia so much. God says, no, we take care of those who even can't, can't, cannot take care of themselves. Verse 29. Even he who cannot keep himself alive. Verse 30. And posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. He's saying, I'm going to take care of everyone, even those who can't take care of themselves. And those who come after you, verse 31, are going to go and they're going to hear about it as well. You're going to go and tell others what has happened and how the Lord has taken care of you. One of the best ways to reach out is to tell others of God's care and love that He has shown towards you. Now, of course, today we talk, we talk to individuals, they have a different idea about what miracle is. When we think of miracle, we think of something that's beyond nature. We think sometimes, some think, well, it's a miracle when, you know, a, a check comes in the mail in time, or, or whatever the case may be. We have different reasons, we have different ideas concerning miracles today. But we can see how the Lord is always taking care of us. We don't have to be, we think about all the times throughout the years we've had difficulties and how the Lord has provided. Maybe not necessarily in financial ways, but also in physical ways. And that is by our health. Some, some of us can say, well, you know, I've actually done pretty well with my health. I'm not, I'm not 
uh, you know, a, a spring chicken, so to speak. But I do, pr I do pretty well with my own health. I haven't been in the hospital a lot and those types of things. And so the Lord takes care of us in various different ways. And this is something we see throughout the Bible. You notice in Psalm 78, Psalm 78 and verse 4, he says, We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. Do you remember one of the first things they were to do after they crossed the Red Sea and the waters came back and it crushed all the armies behind them? They were to make basically a, a monument to set up stones. So when their children came in the next generation, they could say, this is to mark what the Lord has done in this place. And they could tell them all about the crossing of the Red Sea and how the Lord destroyed those armies pursuing them. They were to tell others who came after them about what the Lord has done for them. So we have seen the proclamation and vows in Psalm 22. We have seen how those who are struggling have a reason to praise God. And also as we get to Psalm 22, verse 27, we see that the Lord indeed reigns. Look at Psalm 22 and verse 27. The Bible says, All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. He's making a reference there to those who had once been a follower of God, who have turned, turned back, especially during Old Testament times, and went back to maybe to an idol or something, and realized the error of their ways and come back to God. And so he says, All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. You know, on the day of judgment, will be a, a day for a lot of surprises for people, especially for the atheists who will not be able to turn to the Lord now. Well, they'll remember all those times they've talked to believers. And they'll be very, very sorry, to say the least. But we see here, this is a reference to those who maybe have departed, now they have come back to God. He says, he says they shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. The nation, that is God's people, will worship the Lord. Many who have strayed will return to Him because, as we mentioned before, all of his benefits, Psalm 68 in verse 19 says, Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. You notice there it's daily, isn't it? Do you remember what else in the New Testament where Christ talks about how the Lord takes care of us daily? In his model prayer it says, Give us this day our what? Our daily bread. And we find the same idea here in the Old Testament. Daily the Lord takes care of us. He says in verse 19, who daily loads us up with benefits, with all the things that we need. Where the world gets mixed up at is when they look at needs, the same ideas are wants. But if you think about how the Lord reigns over the nations, let's consider Psalm 9 and verse 17. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and He rules over the nations. The kingdom is the Lord. That's a reference there how the Lord's people make up a nation. You know, Israel was God's chosen people. And they were called the nation of Israel. Well, they were just a group of people, weren't they? The church today, Christians today, are a spiritual Israel. We are a spiritual nation before God. And God rules over that nation. Look at Psalm 22 in verse 28. Let me back up. Psalm 22 and verse 28. Where the Bible says, For the kingdom is the Lord's, and He rules over the nations. Those in God's kingdom are blessed by their king. And not only in salvation, but also we have seen through His laws. So we saw already, God takes care of the poor. And He instructs, as we see even in the New Testament, He instructs those who are wealthy to help out those who are less fortunate. The king's laws is God's laws, provides for those who are in need. And God rules over the nations that belong to him. God's rule brings prosperity and blessings. You think back to, if you look at history, true, accurate, honest history, when this nation began and the quote-unquote founding fathers came over, we were actually very blessed. If you look at how quickly we, we, we grew and all the things that happened, we were very prosperous. Because even though they weren't what we would call New Testament Christians, 
a lot of what they believed in, a lot of what they taught, a lot of what they wrote down laws is based off biblical principles. Look at Psalm 33 and verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Now that's just the first part there. But you think about the point he's making. A nation that follows after God, whose laws are based off biblical principles, naturally follows, they're going to be blessed. You look, for instance, in the Old Testament, any time a nation had God on their side and they were going into the battle, what would happen? They would annihilate people. And they would even pursue them and completely and utterly destroy them. But the second they disobeyed, it would not turn back to God. We have an example after example of what happens. For instance, we have examples of those armies who wanted to go up and, and go into battle. And God said, do not go. They went anyway. What happened? They were killed. They were slaughtered because they were not obeying God. But a nation who, that obeys God always prospers. And a nation without God is a nation that will fail. As we close this evening, the faithful is blessed when they allow God to reign over their lives. If someone is reigning over you, it means that they are doing what? They are, you might say, in charge of you. And we do as we are instructed. Only God is the one who's supposed to be the one who reigns over us, isn't he? You know, even elders are not supposed to lord over the flock, but God is supposed to lord over the flock. He is supposed to reign over us. All the blessings that come from such a life causes or should cause the follower to praise God for all his blessings. Notice, if you will, Psalm 104 and verse 3. Here the Bible says, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. He's saying, I will sing praises to God as long as there is breath in my lungs. He's going to sing praise to God. Shouldn't that be our attitude as well? That so long as we're alive, we're going to praise God for everything that He has given us. And if we think we're in need, we think there's, there's something we, we need in our life, we should bring that, those things before God, who is the righteous judge, who is the, has the, the greatest wisdom of, of all. And allow Him to take care of us and to put our lives under His control. As Christians, we should remember always that God is to reign over us. If we want to be blessed, if we want to have a life that's going to end and come to culmination with life, with God and Christ, not the faithful in heaven, we must allow Him to reign over us. As you think about these things this evening, we know there's probably a lot of these, these things we probably have discussed before. But we need, we need to be mindful that God is our commander, you might say. He is the one who is to be in charge of our lives. There used to be a TV show years ago called Charles in Charge. Well, when it comes to our lives, God is supposed to be the one in charge. He is supposed to be the one who guides us through His Word. And when we do so, we will be blessed and we will be taken care of. This evening, as you think about these things, if you have any needs or concerns or prayer requests, you make those needs known. Let's get every stand and sing the song that's been selected.